first we will start with an introduction to Mobility Lab Helsinki by the project manager Juho Kostiainen from Business Helsinki. Uh, then we will have an exciting presentation by Christoph Bell from Technical University of uh, Munich. Uh, the title of the presentation or keynote speech is Possibilities of City GML 3, uh, focusing on the transportation module explaining the standard and the possibilities that the City GML 3 holds for city information modeling. And uh, then next, we have a technical specialist Juho Pekka Virtanen from Forum Virum Helsinki. And Juho Pekka will share the objectives and aims of the two pilots that took place this spring. And then finally, we will have two great presentations by uh, the two companies, Citovice and Zero Gravity, both of which were selected to participate in the experiments. And um, yeah, in those both pilots, source data was produced uh, from selected street areas in Jatkasari and Esplanari. Uh, the resulting data of the pilots, it will be utilized uh, by the Helsinki City Executive Office uh, to enhance the city's information modeling. And uh, towards the end of the event, we will have some time for uh, questions and answers. Uh, directed to the two companies, but also to um, Christoph Bell. And uh, you can also ask a question here in Maria01 by raising your hand, and we will then hand you a microphone so everyone online can also hear you. And then everyone online, you can raise your hand, and Matthias will point at me, and then uh, you can ask a question. But uh, as of now, you can keep your mics muted. So um, our mics are only open here. And um, yeah, this event will be also recorded and uploaded to the YouTube channel of Forum Virium. So for those who couldn't join us today or those who want to go through the presentations again. So really today, the goal for us here is to share knowledge and to enhance the understanding of the possibilities offered by the new version of City GML standard. Okay. So now we are all set for the first presentation, and that would be Juho Kostiainen. And Juho will give a brief introduction to Mobility Lab Helsinki. Okay, good morning. I'm Joko Stern from Business Helsinki. And uh, a really brief introduction into what the Mobility Lab Helsinki is. So as a background, it's based on the city strategy. We want to develop the city of Helsinki as a place for new innovations to be developed and established. This is done in collaboration with companies, universities, and of course the people as well, hopefully creating a better place for the people and the businesses. This is something we do in a range of different topics from uh, education technology to health and well-being. And of course, the mobility lab represents the smart mobility aspect of it. So you can read more about these different topics and the approach from testbed.hel.fi. Uh, Basically, what it means, what the idea is that we want to provide the city itself, whether it's the streets, buildings, other infrastructure, and of course, the data of the city for different developers to utilize. So companies can test their new ideas, new prototypes, new ideas in practice in the real world with the real people. And while we do this from the economic development point of view, of course, the idea is that after that development period, the new innovations and products and services create a better uh, better city and better services for the people as well. Basically, in this activity, we have a few basic objectives. First of all, it's about the collaboration and 
ecosystem of the different uh, uh, companies, the city, different city departments, different players in the city uh, space, uh, academia, and so on, trying to find new ways of collaborating, new ideas, creating new things. From a focus area point of view, digital twins, which today's uh, event is more focused on. That's one of the things that we're pushing more and more, while at the same time, any kind of services in the field of smart mobility are, are within the scope of our activities. And uh, finally, the third part here, the main thing is that we want to enable the testing in the real urban space. So finding the right places, figuring out uh, how to communicate to the people, how to engage the right partners and communicating, getting feedback from the pilots and of course the practicalities of where to actually test something, how to get it done, what kind of permits might be needed, where to get the power and all those pesky issues that often are uh, challenging for new real practical things. But that's the really brief introduction. If you have any ideas of your own, any interests of piloting your own solutions, just uh, feel free to contact me at any time. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Juho. And uh, now we are moving forward. Now it is the uh, time to introduce uh, Christoph Bale, a researcher at the Chair of Geoinformatics at the Technical University of Munich. Christoph has actually been involved in the development of the city GML3 transportation model, so now we will hear a presentation from Christoph. Thank you very much for the opportunity to give this presentation. My name is Christoph Beil. I'm a researcher at the Chair of Geoinformatics at the Technical University of Munich. And I was also involved in the development of the City GML3 transportation module. And I, in this presentation, I want to talk about a little bit about the concepts of City GML3, especially with regard to road modeling. And I want to show to you some potential applications for these kinds of models. First, let's have a look at the motivation for this topic. The focus of 3D city models so far has mostly been on representations of buildings or the terrain. But recently, there's an increasing relevance to detailed spatial semantic representations of the street space of roads and um, street infrastructure. This is mainly due to two reasons. First of all, there's an increased availability of highly detailed data, for example, from mobile mapping campaigns. And secondly, there are new and emerging applications, for example, in the context of urban digital twins that require these kind of data and 3D models of roads, for example. But these applications often not only require the geometric information, but and especially semantic and topological information, as well as georeference data. And all of this ideally in a structured and standardized form. So while there are a number of existing standards dealing with modeling roads, for example, Open Drive, very commonly used in the automotive industry, OpenStreetMap also contains information on, on streets, IFC, uh, geographic data files, a standard very commonly used in navigation systems, for example. However, all of these standards have in common that they mostly focus on a linear representation of roads or use a parametric geometric representation, which is also not ideal for GIS-related applications, for example. And there are a number of use cases in various fields of applications which require an explicit aerial surface-based representation of roads, for example, in infrastructure planning and construction management, uh, also in mobility, transportation applications, in classical uh, GIS-related environmental simulations and analysis, but also for land administration or topographic mapping applications, these kind of models are required. And so the rep representation of the street space as part of a standardized and consistent semantic 3D SIDL model can be the basis for a number of these applications and can then also be uh, directly combined with exist existing LOD2 building models, for example, or vegetation models, so city furniture models, models of bridges and tunnels, and thus form a consistent and standardized 3D city model, including information on roads. 
And so the question is, how can objects of the street space be structured and standardized? And also what semantic, geometric and topological properties and relations are required to serve a number of applications and use cases. And as you can see in this screenshot here, which is a 3D street space model uh, we created in Ingolstadt, for example, uh, this can contain many different uh, individual objects. And so with CityGML3, now it is possible to have a standardized representation of this street space. And with street space, we not only mean the surfaces uh, that you can see here, but literally, quite literally also the space above these surfaces where uh, the traffic actually takes place. And that's what I want to have a look in the next few slides a little bit. First of all, a brief background to CityGML. I'm, I'm sure most of you are very aware of the standard. It is an international OGC standard based on GML3. There are a number of uh, GIS-related open source tools available for it, and it is very commonly used in semantic 3D city modeling. For example, all buildings, LOD2, for example, in Germany are available in according to the CityGML standard. And key strengths of the standard are that data normally is georeferenced. It uses 3D geometries. You can have topological information. It has rich semantic capabilities. It's possible to represent time-dependent properties, and it's also possible to have uh, visualizations. Also, large city models can be managed, for example, using geodatabases, such as the open source 3D city database. And the latest version of CityGML 3.0 was published in uh, September 2021. And also recently, the GML encoding of uh, CityGML was finalized. And everything you can uh, find online for free, of course. So CityGML has a modular structure. This means there are certain modules that define how certain parts of a city should be modeled. There's a building model module you're probably very aware of, of course. And the module I want to talk about a little bit in the next minutes is the so-called transportation module, which is used to define concepts on how to represent roads and the street space in general. I also want to hint at this guideline, which is called Road to City GML3, which was pub published recent recently, where all of the concepts I will talk about uh, in the next few minutes are also explained in more detail and with uh, data set examples. There are open data downloads available that go along with the explanations in this guideline. And so you can find uh, detailed information on the semantic uh, concepts of CityGML with regard to road modeling, for example, and much more. So one of the basic concepts in CityGML is that objects get uh, decomposed into a hierarchical structure, which means that for example, roads, as you can see here in this example, um, get decomposed into individual sections and intersections. And these sections and intersections can be further decomposed into individual objects called traffic areas, which, for example, can be used to represent individual lanes. And each of these individual objects also can be clearly identified with a unique identifier called GML ID. And in the next few slides, I want to have a detailed, more detailed look at this uh, semantic decomposition concept. So as I mentioned before, the um, top level feature in this context is called simply road, and it is used as a representation for a transportation space that is used by vehicles, but also bicycles or pedestrians. And usually individual roads can be distinguished by individual road names. So here a very simple example of a road in Melbourne, I think, which is called Victoria Street. So everything highlighted here in purple would be part of one big road object within this city model, so to say. So in order to have smaller, ma more manageable uh, data and also to have a hierarchically structured data set, as mentioned before, these roads can or should be decomposed into individual sections and intersections, where you can see an example of a simple section here on this screen uh, shot highlighted in, in orange, where a section represents part of a road that can be clearly assigned to one road. And this section concept also applies, for example, to railway networks, to tracks or to waterway networks, which allows a consistent modeling of these different kind of infrastructure within one uh, consistent semantic 3D city model. And these sections should ideally cover the entire width of, of the road, including, for example, sidewalks or bicycle paths that go along driving lanes, for example. And I will later talk a little bit about uh, the granularity concept that was introduced in CityGML. And um, for now, it's sufficient to know that this representation with the entire width of the road would correspond to a granularity, which is called area in this case. And um, corresponding to sections are then so-called intersections, here highlighted in blue, which basically represent parts of roads that 
are part of multiple roads. So for example, uh, a simple road intersection here, but also an intersection between a road or a railway network, for example, a level crossing can be modeled as an intersection. And there are concepts within CityGML that allow a non-redundant representation of intersections and allow these intersections to be linked to multiple roads uh, using the so-called X-link concept, um, which um, I don't have the time now to go into more detail, but um, it's sufficient to know that these intersections can be modeled once, but um, it can be indicated that they are part of multiple roads at the same time. This, for example, is also again an uh, example in Melbourne, where you can see the road network decomposed into individual sections and intersections with sections in orange and um, intersections highlighted in blue. As mentioned before, these sections and intersections then get decomposed a little further into so-called traffic spaces. And these traffic spaces are used to represent the space in which the traffic actually tra takes place. As you can see on the bottom left image, uh, these volumetric geometries, for example, are used to represent these traffic spaces. And in addition to traffic spaces, so-called traffic areas are modeled, which represent the ground surface of traffic spaces. So for example, individual traffic lanes, for example. It's also possible to have um, an explicit representation of so-called clearance spaces, which represents the free space above the traffic area where a mobile object can move without contacting an obstruction, or at least should be able to do that. And this also allows a seamless transition between indoor spaces and outdoor spaces. So um, within buildings, for example, rooms and, and other spaces can be modeled. And so this allows a seamless transition between these spatial representations from the indoor and the outdoor model. Traffic spaces, as mentioned before, get bounded towards the ground with so-called traffic areas, which represent the ground surface. And there's a basic distinction between so-called traffic areas, which represent um, the areas where traffic actually takes place and so-called auxiliary traffic areas, which describe further elements of roads, such as raised medians or green areas that are not directly intended for traffic usage, but are um, somewhat related to, to a road object, for example, as you can see here in, in this example. I want to briefly have a look at the level of granularity concept that was introduced to CityGML road objects. There are basically three levels of granularity. The granularity area I already talked about a little bit, which is used to model a single road ob object, for example. On the slide uh, below, you can see an example for the granularity way, where each individual carriageway is represented. And the highest level of granularity is called lane, where then each individual lane is represented, as you can see in this example. And this is not only valid for surface-based representations of um, models, in CityGML, it is also possible to have a consistent linear representation of uh, road infrastructure, again, with these three levels of granularity. Granularity area here would basically correspond to uh, center line representation for each individual road. In granularity way, one line per carriage way would be used. And in the highest level of granularity, then each individual lane would be represented with, each, uh, with an individual center line representation. Geometries used in CityGML correspond to ISO 19107 and the most important geometry types that are uh, allowed for the, in the context of transportation module are multi-curve or multi-surface geometries, so for linear representations or surface-based representations. But it is also uh, possible, for example, to use point clouds directly to model, for example, the traffic space. Nearly all geometries in CityGML use 3D coordinates and usually are also linked directly to a coordinate reference system, um, which gives the uh, georeference information of the data. There are also new topological concepts in CityGML3. For example, there's a new predecessor successor concept introduced to, to this uh, model for traffic spaces. So each traffic space contains an information which other traffic space can be reached from a certain point, for example. And also a traffic direction attribute was introduced and this information is very relevant, for example, for routing or navigation applications. And at the moment, we are have, uh, having a master thesis done at our chair, which um, has a detailed look and it, at uh, navigational applications and how CityGML3 data can be used to serve these applications. Again, an X-Link concept is uh, used for a non-redundant representation and to model these uh, link links between individual parts of the road network. 
Nothing new is the appearance. Every city GML object can have multiple appearances. So a road object, for example, can be represented once geometrically, but linked with multiple different textures or colors, for example. In this example, you can see a city model, including a road model of New York City on the left side, textured with a generic with generic textures and on the right side textured according to results of a solar irradiation analysis. As mentioned before, the concepts I talked about with this decomposition into sections, intersections, traffic spaces, traffic areas and so on is not only valid for road geometries or road objects, but also for railways or waterway infrastructure, which is now standardized in CityGML3. And this allows a combined and non-redundant geometric and semantic modeling of multiple transportation infrastructure within one common, consistent, integrated and complete 3D city model. Because as you can see on this on the slide below, road infrastructure and especially railway infrastructure often do not just coexist next to each other, but often directly interact. And so it is for many applications, it is necessary to have a non-redundant representation in a consistent 3D model. And with this um, city GML, concepts of uh, sections and intersections, especially it is possible to have one consistent model representation. There's also a publication on this topic uh, available. I'll um, have the links in the, in the slides later on. It's also possible to model roads, for example, as parts of bridges. So a traffic area, a uh, road lane basically, which uh, is on a bridge can have the information uh, semantically that it is on the one hand side part of a road, but at the same time also part of a bridge. So again, this concept of a non-redundant geometric and semantic representation, where you have uh, an object that has all the semantic information necessary for different kinds of application, in this case, uh, a road that is on a bridge, for example. Also, roads can be modeled within buildings. So for example, within a bigger parking garage, it is possible to have a representation of the road network or road surfaces within the building while having for each individual semantic surfing surface having the information on the one hand side, for example, that it is a roof surface part of the building and at the same time it can be a traffic area part of the road network. There are also other relevant city GML objects such as squares, so it's possible to model large sealed surfaces within a city model such as parking lots or gas stations. Also, um, public plazas, for example, can be modeled and also decomposed into these so-called traffic areas. Markings can be represented as individual objects, um, which you can see here. It's also possible now to model individual holes in the surfaces of road objects, such as um, roadway damages, for example, but also manholes, as you can see here. It's possible to have city furniture modeled, um, and this was available in CityGML2 as well where you can have individual objects to represent, for example, traffic signs or traffic lights, all with um, linked with semantic information and attributes, for example, or bus stations, bike racks, and so on, can all be part of these thematic 3D city model if the information is available. Also, vegetation has been available in CityGML2 before, where it's possible to represent individual trees, individual um, plants, which uh, have an can have of an influence in for some of the applications uh, in in relation to uh, roads and the traffic space. Also, CityGML contains a so-called dynamizer concept, which enables you to link dynamic data with individual semantic objects, which can also be relevant for transportation space representation. In this case, you can see an example of an induction loop, which basically counts the number of cars that go through this lane, and this information can be directly linked to the corresponding lane, for example. There are some examples of uh, semantic 3D city models already, which are in part um, were created in, uh, using the city GML2 standard, but there are also a number of uh, examples already available in the, according to concepts of city GML3. One example, uh, one previous example, which was created with city GML2 is uh, of New York City, which contains over 500,000 individual street space objects. And you can find all the examples I want to show to you in the next slides via the link also in on these slides, which will be available, made available afterwards. Another example is in Ingolstadt, where you can see this semantic 3D street space model according to CityGML2 and CityGML3, which was created from original OpenDrive data. So at the chair, we developed an automatic converter from OpenDrive data to CityGML3, and you can see one of the uh, conversion results here on this slide. 
Also, the city of Munich is currently in its uh, urban digital twin project in the course of creating a so-called lane model, which aims to have a digital representation of roads, including traffic rules, on a lane level accuracy. The goal is to have a linear as well as a polygonal representation citywide, and it's also planned to have this lane model then uh, later provided in the city GML3 uh, compliant standard. I want to briefly talk about some of the potential applications. So here you can see the model of New York again, where uh, all of the individual surfaces contain on the one hand side information on surface areas, for example. Uh, it is in, uh, the information on the street name is contained and also those surfaces contain pavement ratings. So it can be estimated by doing a simple analysis on the pavement ratings, how much surface of a, of a certain road might need to get repaired in the future, which then can be used to make uh, cost estimations for these potential repair costs of, of roads. In the context of public participation, these 3D models can also be quite useful. This is an example of Munich, where the model was used to show a potential um, planning of a current scenario on the left-hand side, where much more space would be given to pedestrians and bic bicyclists in this case. And this was very well received in this concrete example for public participation to use this 3D representation. A recent study we did is on the evaluation of the quality of bicycle paths, where based on the width and the slope and other semantic information, uh, an evaluation of the entire bicycle network in a certain area was conducted with a certain score. And the results of this visualization was also again visualized within the semantic 3D city model again in the end. There are also automotive and transportation related applications. We did a study on creating a traffic simulation using uh, this semantic road model, and then in the end also um, visualized the results of this traffic simulation within a web-based um, visualization, which can be immediately accessed via any web browser. And you can see a simple screenshot here on the left-hand side, the real scenario, and on the right-hand side, what the visualization, including bridges, uh, traffic objects, and so on, looked like. Another uh, publication we did uh, a while ago is on pedestrian simulations, where a city GML model was used as a base map, as input data for a, a pedestrian simulation, which contained information on surfaces that can be, that are walkable, so to say, that can be used by pedestrians, and other surfaces that are obstacles or should not be used by pedestrians. These 3D city models and 3D road models can also be helpful, for example, for visibility analysis, line of sight analysis, as you can see here, for example, in this case, uh, a point on a bicycle path was used to evaluate which other um, points in this city model can be seen. So, for example, which driving lanes can be seen from this point of view. This could be also done in the other way to determine um, if, for example, from a certain point on a driving lane, bicyclists nearby could be seen by uh, car drivers, for example. Another simulation we did is uh, solar irradiation analysis, which is already pretty common for uh, building models. And I think that's also available in Helsinki, for example. And we used it or tried it on the semantic um, road model that was available for a part in Munich to do basically a local heat um, analysis and to show the effect also on of vegetation, for example, on public spaces. So on the left-hand side, you can see uh, the, this model and the result of this analysis where the vegetation model is also um, visible. On the right-hand side, the vegetation is excluded, so you can see directly the effect of um, the vegetation on the urban heat in this area, for example. So in conclusion, there are revised and extended concepts in CityGML3 to model transportation infrastructure. There are detailed concepts for geometric and semantic segmentation. It is possible to have multiple geometric representations, including linear representations, aerial representations, volumetric representations, but also to use point clouds, for example. This concept of spaces is now included, which allows, for example, a seamless transition between indoor and outdoor spaces. There are multiple levels of granularity, down to lane level granularity. And this integrated representation also allows for uh, an integrated representation of multiple transportation infrastructure, so roads, railways, footpaths, waterways, bicycle paths, and so on, can be represented within one consistent model. And I briefly teased a little bit or showed a little bit on the potential, some of the potential applications that already have been done and that um, I'm sure will be uh, increasing also in the future with these semantic models more and more available. 
With that, thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to answer any potential questions and I'm also very curious to see uh, what the city of Helsinki already uh, did using CityGML3, especially on roads and what are the plans for the future. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you again, Christoph, for, for a very thorough, uh, interesting presentation on CityGML3. And uh, we're glad to have you here with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to give this presentation. And uh, as I said, I'm very happy to answer any potential questions. Perfect. And uh, I believe you will also be sticking around until the end of the event. So uh, if we have some more questions, um, they can be also presented in the end. But I have uh, one question here uh, from uh, online participant. What kind of source GIS data you see most crucial for modeling area type presentations for off roads? And yeah. maybe from your experience, yeah. are also photos detailed enough? Yeah, so this highly depends, of course, on the potential application or use case you want to serve with this kind of data. So from the models I showed in the presentation, actually, the model of New York, for example, was created by the um, department in New York from uh, digital auto photo imagery, which then resulted in basically uh, 2D GIS information with an accuracy of, I guess, better than 10 centimeters. And if your application requires this kind of resolution, then this kind of uh, source data will be sufficient. The model of Ingolstadt I showed, for example, which was created from open drive data with the converter we developed at our chair, um, got converted from open drive, which has an HD map format used in automated driving development, for example. And there are companies that produce this kind of data on the basis of mobile mapping campaigns. So from very highly detailed point clouds with an accuracy of better than three centimeters, even below one centimeter in some case, because in this case, or for this application, this uh, resolution or accuracy is required. So um, long answer to say it depends, <laughs> but both of um, these, those, or these two different kinds of data sources with different kinds of resolutions have been used to produce the GML3 data for different kinds of use cases. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. Any questions here from the audience? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's um, ev evidently we are talking about mobility and that's why the topics uh, around uh, um, traffic and roads are in the center of our attention today in this uh, discussion. However, uh, I would like to ask uh, how do you integrate uh, building data uh, or maybe you can have some use cases uh, that um, uh, show a successful integration of building data into uh, uh, into this uh, data environment, I don't know how to call it properly. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So I think that's also one advantage of CityGML because CityGML is already very well established for modeling, for example, LOD2 building models, as you can see. I don't know if you if you can see me in, in, in the audience, but um, in, in the background of my image, I have an LOD2 building model of, of the city of Munich, for example, and I think similar data is available in Helsinki and uh, for many big cities in Europe, at least. And so um, I think it's very helpful to have a um, representation of roads and street infrastructure in the same standardized format as um, building models that are um, usually or often uh, already available. And one potential application I could think where uh, roads um, or road space in combination with buildings could play a role would be analysis, for example, on parking spaces. So if I know a certain number of people living in a certain area, and I have detailed information on available parking spaces in that area, maybe I could do a quick or basic estimation on the, um, yeah, if there are enough parking spaces, for example, to serve this, this area, which would be a very basic um, analysis, which we could make use of building in model information and uh, speed model information. But I'm sure there are many more I haven't thought of now from the top of my head. Thank you, Christoph. And maybe some additional questions can be asked uh, in the end, as we are a bit late in the schedule. So now, thank you, Christoph. Uh, see you later on in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Perfect. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, do we have my slides here?
So the uh, intention in this very brief commentary was to try frame this ongoing CTGML3 pilot into the broader development of, of digital twins of urban mobility and, and in a way create the motivation for these pilots whilst doing that. So uh, we've approached the idea of having a digital twin of urban mobility by identifying that it would likely contain at least three main dimensions, them being the description of, of the infrastructure, the description of the traffic activities that occur in the city or mobility activities, and, and then the description of the conditions that occur. And we've noticed that there are several potential applications. This is not an exhaustive list. Those are there mostly for example. So, so we can think that if we'd have this data, it would be very likely that we could improve traffic management, mobility services, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and how would this in practice happen? Is is via the creation of new tools and and creation of new methods. Uh, these tools probably can include both very automated things such as machine learning based analysis, and then very human oriented things like new dashboards or user interfaces into the data that we then use in processes to accomplish these tasks. And, and what's common in many of them is that they, they actually become a, a data integration task. So in order to do better traffic management, we need better information from the environment, we need better information from the conditions, and we need to be able to combine these. And, and what this actually boils down into is that we also, in addition to all other data sources, we will need a sufficiently good and detailed description of the urban environment to have something to, to connect data to and, and to have something to look at as, as a point of interest in analysis use. And, and what are the currently existing sort of a data sources for this? Well, uh, of course, the existing geospatial data in, in the city is one, and then there are also all the new survey methods that allow accurately digitizing the urban environment and, and then processing it towards objects. But the main point here was that in order to get to these new uh, solutions by data integration, we will also have to improve the state of, of the infra description in the city significantly. And, and this was, in a way, the starting point for what we want to test with is GML3 and what is the data production challenge here. Thank you. Thank you, Juho Pekka. And uh, I think this serves as a very good background to what's going to happen next. So we are jumping into the first company presentation, the first pilot, 3D modeling of traffic areas, production of city GML, three compatible data from Ulre, uh, spatial data. So I would like to welcome Nora Berg from Sitovice and Mika Virtanen from Sitovice to come here. Yes. Uh, good morning. Everyone, thanks for the invitation. It's very nice to be here. We have this uh, divided this presentation so that I will just take the opportunity to present Citavice just very, very shortly. And then Mika will continue with the project. My name is Nora Barry and I work as project manager at Citavice. And yes, I, we, I will, I've been helping here with the practical things. Mm. We call ourselves the smart city company, uh, which means that we design and help to create smart cities. Uh, we want to build a society where living and moving and working is easy and safe. And this is the aim of the company. Um, okay, that's... <laughs> The little bit strange, but the idea was here to give you some some facts about Citovice. We have some uh, 2,200 employees, and the head office is here in Espo area. We have some 30 offices around the country, but 
the, my, most of the people work here in Espoo. And we operate in three business areas, which are buildings, which is probably the one that you know Sitava is best about. Also infrastructure management and buildings is one our one bigger business area. But then me and Mika, we present the digital solutions. So we have a quite a strong growing uh, business area that is uh, focusing on digital solutions and all of all kinds of smart city solutions. And this project is obviously very well connected to this. And yeah, we say that we have some 100,000 completed project, which is obviously growing all the time. Mm, and then just a few words what we think about what, what the future will look like. Uh, there are some mega trends that we, we aim for, and these are all things that we want to tackle. Urbanization, of course, because we believe, or it is said that about one, two thirds of people are going to live in cities in the future. So that's why it's kind of one of the most wanted focus areas. Uh, then also backlog. We all know that the maintenance backlog of buildings and, and streets is growing all the time. And there is a huge, huge need for more project there. And, and we need to focus on that as well. Uh, we want to tackle these issues and challenges through digitalization. And because we know that the amount of data is growing, so we need solutions for, for to tackle this uh, growing uh, amount of data that is coming. Then, of course, climate change is also coming. And to these all areas, we are working on to solve and give you solutions. Then the last slide before Mika can continue. Uh, these are the services that the company is involved in. And here we can see that digital solutions is involved in all these. So, so we as digital experts are going to are helping in all these. We have our project in all these areas. Then Mika. Thank you, Nora, <coughs> and hello to everybody. <coughs> this this project proof of concept quick study is based on earlier work done in a similar setting, which was to, to make a conversion from, or actually a basic FME tool to con convert the ULRE register, the register of public areas and the, especially the transportation parts of it into city GML 2.0. And that was fairly straightforward, just area to area attribute mapping and making it three-dimensional. And this, this study was to <coughs> see how the city GML data model would be created with a similar approach possible. Mm -hmm. And of course it is possible, but quickly the new features. Okay, there are the traffic spaces there are are some new feature types like markings and holes but the most important was the division to sections intersections and the granul granularity and the links between the sections and the intersections which create then the network of traffic New feature classes, they already came in the keynotes, so I can skip a little bit. And the section of the road, it's a longitudinal section with similar attribute set or between intersections. And then here is the topology representation with X links and the traffic direction value also is connected to this in a way that if, if there is a predecessor successor it can go either forward backwards or both ways and the thematic granularity which also was re already represented uh, so the basic basic division is to street areas 
And then in this case, especially because of the ULRE register area for different means of transportation, and then there is also a possibility to define separate lanes on the way level granularity. Uh, and this is somehow connected to the level of detail. And in this one, it would be level of detail to maximum. And the possibilities, LOD geometries, which are already, which are defining the object as they are with a real geometric representation as LOD2 is more generalized generalized data and we were going in the idea of this semantic model from the use of the network so the basic questions are what modes of transport are allowed in the section or intersection and what is the direction of the transportation there and how do these sections and intersections link and then going towards the digital twin idea is the dynamizer module of the city gml tree which gives an opportunity or possibility to define or change the attributes for a certain feature from outside the actual base data and here is the some details and links about the dynamizer module and the processing of this proof of concept, the source data sets, they are basically open data. They are from the web feature service of Helsinki and specifically the ULRE register. And that is two dimensional features from the web feature service. And then there is also the web coverage service for elevation model. To to, for the conversion into three-dimensional data. And here is a sample of the tools. The FME, FME form nowadays with a new logo. And some manual or assisted semi-automatic work with MicroStation for digitizing and then, then the inspector of the FME and uh, Googies for for visual inspection and quality control. Intersections. How to create the intersections into this ULRE data? It is in these sample areas. It's made manually, but it's not actual digit actually did necessary to digitize all the intersection areas. Most of them are already lined up, so maybe one more extra line and then create the area from that. That could be also made automatic to a very large part. And then this was the really manual part to define, define the flow of the traffic so the links between the areas the intersections and sections and that would that would need some additional data for creating creating this kind of network network topology for the for the data and then there is another another set of data which is also produced from the Rural register where the trans methods of transportation are divided. So, driving lanes and pedestrian areas, cyclist lanes, and combined the light traffic. And uh, crosswalks are also added into this so that the different types of types of traffic can be combined into an area. Crosswalk is a uh, subsection of a section or so there it, it is a section and the intersections are separate from that and then there is a small part where where traffic into two 
vertical levels are represented. Uh, for that, it is that requires also some manual work or definition of the elevation models or other tools of mapping the vertical location of the feature. What that would probably come together with creation of bridges and tunnels because they basically share the geometry in, in city GML data model so that the same same geometric feature could have could be represented as a bridge roof or as a traffic area and this was also made with manual digitization digitizing uh, but then again it it was not completely manual digitizing but more like point and accept type of thing so that could be also made automatic to some extent at least there are challenges from jumping from gis data to a semantic data model model and the most most challenging thing is uh, is the lack of intersections they have to be created separately and of course the connections between sections and intersections the flow of the traffic and the automation of these things requires additional data or some heuristic processes and there are some ideas about how to automatize the detection of the <coughs> intersection areas could be image detection of road markings and then existing knowledge of traffic signs and traffic lights which with some kind of combination could find could locate most of the intersections and then there are these bridges and underpasses and tunnels which already have their own own module the construction module in city gml so that would be that would be possibly defined already in a different different module and the traffic areas on multiple levels you need to have special 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 dms dms for for the areas on vertical levels or use some other mean of mapping them and that was the representation of what we did here so the the main main thing is that it is based on an existing database and trying to enrich it and improve it and that gives some limitations but also a very large database of already existing data. Okay. Thank you so much, Mika and Nora, of this presentation. Uh, as you were just discussing uh, the data sources, I have a, I have a question uh, from the chat. So, uh, were there any important source data types missing uh, that could have um, improved or um, made it better or um, like the lane center line geometries or zebra crossings like what kind of data would be provided by the city so yes this was based completely on the existing database and there were in in, in that data there were no crosswalks or other information about center lines uh, but that could be of course if it's available it could be fairly easily imported into the system and helping and then that would help in the creation of the data okay perfect thank you mika um, do we have some other questions maybe one question from the audience yes um, 
Hi, and where do you um, gather data for uh, buildings? Um, is it like some open source or do you get any um, data from owners? Uh, is it project based? How does it work? This work was focused on the on the traffic areas, the roads. So, but as already said, there is a Helsinki city has a fairly ready database of buildings in city GML format. I believe it's it's open data, open data, and could be downloaded from the Helsinki city map services. Okay. Thank you again for Sitovice for the presentation. And um, yes, we are moving to our second pilot and to the company Zero Gravity. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting to present the pilot. Uh, I will just tell a few words about Zero Gravity. Um, so. Our mission is to build sustainable cities and communities uh, by means of satellite data, data fusion, and machine learning solutions. Uh, in general, our clients are smart cities and a European Space Agency, where we provide uh, data fusion um, of city environments, um, green buildings, and uh, also monitoring of environment by means of satellite data. Yeah, that's uh, about zero gravity. I give uh, the word to Cedric to present the pilot. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, some <laughs> formatting in the presentation. So yeah, we were, as we know a lot for, for today, we are talking about three-dimensional modeling of the street environments, uh, in particular by transport mode. Uh, introduction, like we have told hello today, so I can go quite fast on this slide. So our goal was to use mostly computer vision and machine learning for the modeling of the street environments uh, in the react area mostly. So uh, in this project, we use mostly aerial imagery as input. Um, and then we had two use cases that we looked at. The first was the road marking and then segmentation of bike paths. Um, yeah, very quickly, the, the pipeline is just we, we get some inputs or some image that we can we have to pre-process or so remove shadows and cars from this image. And then also some other kind of processing like contrast colors and so on and so forth. Then the segmentation itself where we uh, get different image uh, sections on the image and then we find the areas of interest so the ones that are actually roadmapped as compared to others. Okay. Uh, so I can, I will go a bit directly into the results. So. This is, for example, from some uh, eight centimeter drone imagery that is also open data from the city of Helsinki. Uh, how we can, using uh, computer vision, like detect automatically the crossing, some road markings. Um, so there is, so this is eight centimeter. So this is really at the limit of the resolution for this process. So you can see that some uh, line separators are not always properly detected, mostly because they start to get too small to be detected there. Then we tried the same on a one centimeter. Uh, drone imagery over one particular crossing or Sonia Kasari, and then you can see that you get pretty good results. Um, and from there, we can also see that uh, this kind of technique can also be used to actually detect like uh, damages into the road markings because you can see like one of these left right area is already starting to fade away and so gets less detected from it. So it's already a good, uh, good solution to actually, if, if this kind of imagery is done regularly, you can detect the evolution of the road markings. Uh, also, some road markings are different. This was the, the same crossing down there, so there was this extra bike marking squares in the crossing down left, which were not existing uh, here, this horizontal one, so those markings were missing in that image. So you can see from there the, the evolution. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. I will. So that was for the for the road markings. I think this our pipeline is working really, really good and is producing quite fast good, good results. Um, now, we, when we try to get uh, to the bike, biking lane and pedestrian lane, there is quite some challenging for automatic uh, algorithm because you can see in this image, the, the top lane is a bike lane, the, the bottom one is a pedestrian lane, but without local knowledge or without like, ma like labeling from the, from the Yulhe, for example, it's, it's really hard for a machine to, to, to guess because it's, it's the same concrete basically for, for a machine. Learning. 
So it is fully automatic without external input is probably quite difficult. Uh, that's why we moved to, to trying to, <coughs> to detect automatically the red paint in bike areas. There are only a few in Helsinki, so we had to change a bit uh, to, to, other er to, to another uh, street sections. Uh, so this was kind of uh, working, but we also had challenges there, mostly due to, to image quality. So we had like the, the 2017 auto photography, uh, which had a problem that it had a red hue on the entire images. So it was basically very hard to get enough contrast. Or the 2021, which is like, there is the opposite, like you have very little hue. So it's, but the detection works, but it's not very, uh, very, uh, very reliable. Uh, so, and you have also, uh, I don't know if I can see it here, for example, you, uh, there were some compression artifacts uh, at some points when created this uh, through auto photography. That, uh, yeah, for example, this red car is giving a, a red hue in the whole area around it. So it thinks that everything around it is a, is a pedestrian path. So, so that was a bit uh, challenging. Uh, so what we wanted to do is that we tried a bit. And you can see that from using your ray, you get much better result. That's also what the, the previous uh, company did. So, <clears throat> at least from the, the, the for, from the uh, for the bike path, I think the, the this automatic detection is not uh, the greatest, at least for, for Helsinki, which doesn't use very high contrast uh, red lane markings. However, for the road markings, this this is working very good. Uh, then I will have a few words again uh, for for adding elevation, since we are talking about 3D models. So, this whole pipeline wasn't this aerial auto photography, which are 2D. So we added the elevation from the from the 50 centimeter elevation model, uh, um, and from the 2D polygon, we get 3D objects, which can be converted. We have exported them in DGN. They can also be put in in a city GML and then put in the correct uh, place there. Again, this has the limitation uh, for bridges and tunnels, but the aerial photography will not anyway like be able to recognize under tunnels what are the road markings. Uh, yeah, so what we used, we used the 8 centimeter auto photography from 2017, the 5 centimeter one from 2021. So 5 centimeter is slightly better for the, uh, for the purpose. So we have also a 50 centimeter elevation map, which, which is enough because most of those road markings are on flat area. So you don't need a very good resolution there. And then the, this one centimeter drawn auto photography that uh, we, we were provided that from VRM is very good also. So that gives a very excellent result. And then the register, the public area was used. Uh, it was also used to, uh, in the previous steps and so the road marking steps uh, to actually extract the road from the, um, <coughs> from the picture so that we are only looking for road markings on the road. Uh, and then we also acquired some play at 50 centimeter images, uh, but this is clearly for the road markings purpose, this is clearly too low resolution. So. Uh, a, a pedestrian crossing is like a couple of pixel wide and this image is not enough. Uh, also, can ne uh, next step, as I said, so there were some challenges for the pedestrian area and red painted area, mostly due to either that they are not enough different or that there is some image quality uh, issues. The road marking this section works very well, can be easily scaled up to larger area because in our case, so the result I have shown there was fully automatic. Um, and uh, yeah, one of the application of, of these road markings could also be like to actually detect the quality of the road markings because some get missing with time or get faded out. Uh, future development, uh, we can add some uh, more precise uh, class naming uh, in the in the road marking so that we actually recognize what is a like a lane separator, uh, turn arrow, pedestrian area, pedest uh, zebra crossing, or, or a bicycle or whatever. Uh, and I think from the road markings, we could probably start to get some lane detection uh, in, in the roads, uh, and then we can scale this algorithm to, to a larger area. So since it, it is in our case mostly automatic, so that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Cedric. Thank you, Olga. There is one question uh, from the chat. Mm -hmm. I will read it as it is. Recently, there has been open source computer vision foundation models released by large companies like Meta. Do you see any interesting tools there that could help in the detecting or segmenting markings? Uh, yeah, definitely uh, for both actually. So for the, 
segmentation of markings, we tried to segment anything, for example, from Meta, which was getting slightly less good results than uh, some simple computer vision techniques or like basic candy transformation, because there is a, a quite big contrast in those markings. So you have white markings on black background. So sometimes just simple computer vision gives better, uh, better result than, than an algorithm that tries to be too generic. Uh, but for, uh, for the for the recognition, definitely, that I said, so recognizing what is a zebra crossing, what is a left over, definitely those, those are, are helpful, yeah. Okay, perfect. Do we have any questions here from, from our audience? Oh, there's a chat, chat question, let me go through it. Um, could you provide formal metrics for segmentation quality, uh, for example, intersection over union uh, for your algorithms? Uh, yeah, no, we didn't actually calculate them because we didn't want it to manually label everything. So it, it was just mostly visual. So we, we could do that, but we, we didn't calculate them. Okay, okay, perfect. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Okay, okay. thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Maybe. Um, there, there are some questions still to both companies. Maybe uh, it's it's time to talk with Christoph. Are you still there online with us? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. So, how did you? What did you? How did you feel about the presentation? Let's say. Yeah, thanks very much. Very interesting. Uh, I very much like both of the presentations, and of course, for me personally, it's also very interesting to see the concept of city GML being tested out. And um, I, especially for the first presentation, I. I I saw that um, you mentioned two very important challenges when creating this kind of data. First of all, you have to make a decision on uh, the most useful geometric and semantic decomposition of road metrics with where exactly does an intersection, for example, end. And of, again, this um, can also depend on potential applications. So um, in the end, it often comes down to be had to have a clear idea on what the data should be used in the end before um, creating um, the data, obviously. And CityGML3 makes some suggestions how to, to create, for example, and decomposition intersections in intersections, but it uh, also lets a lot of freedom to the uh, data creator in order to um, specify, for example, where exactly an, an intersection ends, for example, because depending on the intended use case or applications, um, this might be different. And the second uh, very difficult point when creating this kind of data is to incorporate uh, traffic logic, of course, because simply by looking on, a, on an aerial image, for example, you, even as a manual data creator, you need to have a deep understanding on how the transportation network in this area works. And that might be even different in the US to the European city. Again, of course, in Great Britain, uh, the, the, the cars drive on the left-hand side, and again, everything changes. So it's very difficult to have this in an automated process, and it's already challenging to do that manually. And one last remark to that, maybe, if I may, is uh, I can make a, a short comment on the developments on how that is done or tested out in Munich currently. So um, Munich has a very big project called Urban Digital Twin of the city of Munich. And one part of this project is also a so-called lane model is what they call it. And um, in this context, they are, they are currently in the process of creating a very detailed representation of the road space, similar to, to what you showed actually in, in the first presentation with a lane level representation. And here they decided to have a linear network representation containing all the traffic logic on the one hand side and create simultaneously corresponding aerial representation, which is intended also to be available in city GML in the end. And actually the city created a very detailed and uh, big um, guideline for um, manual data creators in the end to how this data should be gathered and how it should be structured. And I believe um, towards the end of this year, um, it is also planned to have these data or these data gathering guidelines um, openly available to other cities. So that might be interesting, uh, of course, uh, for us to learn what other cities uh, think about these kind of concepts and maybe for you to, to have a look at how the, this data gathering is, is done in Munich. Yeah, I talked a lot. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. If you have further questions, feel free. No, 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 that's perfect. That's really interesting. Maybe that's something we have to um, look up here also. So you have to keep us updated what happens in, in Munich, Christoph. Sure. Very good. Um, do we still have some questions from from uh, from the chat or here in Maria zero one? It it seems that we are we are happy. So thank you, 
again, uh, everyone for the presentations. Thank you to Citovice. Thank you to Zero Gravity. It has been a yeah very good good spring with the um, pilot. So we're happy to have you with us. So, and um, thank you everyone else for joining the event here uh, in situ and, and then also online. And um, you have now received also a short uh, survey uh, to your cell phone or to your email. And we would love to hear uh, your feedback on the event. And uh, of course, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, the uh, recording of this event will be available on Forum Virium, Hel Forum Virium Helsinki's YouTube channel. And um, if you want to go back to the presentations, they will be there very soon. And uh, again, I want to thank you a lot for joining us today. It's the uh, week of midsummer and it's Monday. So it's, I'm, I'm really happy to see so many people here in Maria and online as well. So uh, we are wishing everyone a great summer ahead and uh, see you again in the fall time. So take care. <laughs>